Hey guys, can you believe it? I actually made it on time one minute earlier, but you'll have to bear with me for a couple of minutes because I have nothing set up yet. I just came on this computer like three minutes ago and I still need to kind of, you know, set up the sharing screen stuff. So if you give me a couple of minutes, guys, in the meantime, hi to everybody and thank you so much for joining. So just give me a moment, please. Now, in the meantime, can you just confirm that you can hear me at a proper volume? I mean, my computer is telling me that my mic is working. But again, I do apologize for the quality of the camera. Yeah, it's always the same story, isn't it? Okay, so before we get started, just a quick disclaimer here, guys. By no means am I uh, discrediting Gonzalo Amaral's book. I mean, books, no, they are brilliant. However, I did find, going through the Jill Haven Forum, another book from another inspector at the time. And according to most of the comments, on the forum, it seems that this book is much more detailed than Gonzalo Amaral's books. So maybe there will be some details that, you know, we will find out from the book, which we haven't heard before. So, yeah, I just want to make it clear that I'm not trying to discredit Gonzalo Amaral or uh, say that his book was not good enough. It was, it was brilliant. I mean, the books. But let's see what this other book is from uh, the other detective or inspector and i'll give you his name as well but i'm just gonna wait uh, for a couple of minutes so that more of you can join anyway this book i found the book on the jill haven forum and the book is translated in english well, obviously it's not an official translation a user translated the book, and uh, I just want to give credit to Jill Haven Forum and also the user who translated the book. And uh, obviously, I'm not going to be able to read the whole book today. I have no idea how many pages there are in total because on the Jill Haven Forum, there is a post for every chapter. So again, I don't know how many pages there are in total, but I'm going to tell you one thing. I haven't read anything from the book at all. So this is going to be my first reaction, just like with the second book of Amaral's. Hi, The Wandering Dog. Thank you so much for joining. Okay, so before we start reading the first chapter, I just want to share with you the foreword from the author. And I'll put it on the screen. Uh, ha, ha, let's see. Okay. So anyway, guys, if um, I just want to say that if you want to uh, visit this Jill Haven forum, I need to let you know that you can't access the forum unless you have an account. And I would advise you to open an account because this, uh, this forum is filled with resources and it's just an amazing forum. Okay, so... This is, the book is from the former PJ inspector, Paolo Cristovao's book, A Estrella de Madeline, which is a Madeline star. And uh, again, we thanks to Astro for the translation. Uh, the book is written by Paolo Pereira Cristovao, former PJ inspector, president of the Portuguese Missing Children Association. And I think I need to, to change the layout here because it seems that my camera is kind of hiding what's written there. Hi, Chumba. Thank you for joining. Is it this one? Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, you know what? I'm just going to leave this on the screen for you so you can see. And let me start with a foreword from the author. 
And like uh, you can see here, it says this is not a summary, but a complete translation. The challenge. So much has been written and said about the disappearance of Madeleine McCann, which happened on the 3rd of May 2007 at the Ocean Club Resort in Aldea da Luz near Portimao. Probably even too much. What is certain is that this is maybe one of the most media exposed missing persons cases of our days and therefore has raised in everyone a great anxiety and a desire to know the truth. The popular imagination has produced a thousand and one solutions for the case, but the natural lack of knowledge of the people about all the facts of the investigation, along with their common precipitation, induces them into obvious error. And the truth is that is not yet known what happened to Madeline. Every writer should be aware of the people that he belongs for and for whom he writes for, of its sensibilities and its capacities. In this particular case, I must state as an author, my trust in the famous popular wisdom of these people who has already passed through nine centuries of history with its successive economical identity or community crisis and which never quit being the Portuguese people in Europe, integrated but self-determined orderly but not sheepish. This book intends to launch a challenge to those who read it to be able to distinguish what is fact from what is fiction. is necessary and important to state both legally and eth ethically that there is no intention here of accusing or pointing at guilty people, but only to report a fact or a set of facts that are of public interest, as well as the contradictions that led to the information of certain popular theories. Due to legal issues, it cannot be me the author to tell you what the truth, the truth of the case is. But I can assure you that you can find it here among the lines of this book. I do not intend to dwell over matters that are already widely known by the public. Everyone knows who Jerry and Kate McCann, Russell and Jane Tanner are, Matthew, Rachel and Diane Webster, Clarence Mitchell and Gordon Brown. Everyone knows where the Ocean Club is located, its layout, the location of the tapas bar, the church, the beach of Luz, the village with the same name, the priest and the twins. In spite of this, there are not many who know what prompted the disappearance of this little girl, who was responsible for it, how and why. We will skip a pure hard chronology of the events as it has been made public and analyzed so often already. The steps forward and back in the information of suspects the hundreds of false leads. We constantly forget about the concept of personalization of the facts that were carried out by the policemen. So much has been written about what has been happening in Faro, in Prada Luz, in Portimao, and in London. This book represents the opportunity to say the things that have not been written yet, and essentially what nobody has thought yet, or did not have the courage to reveal. Hence the challenge that is proposed to you that of finding what is real in between the absurd of true facts and of fiction. The truth tends sometimes to lose its characteristical clarity and simplicity only to become herself a factor that is as doubtful and obscure as the society that he refers to. It's a paradox that in so many investigations, the intense search for the desired truth in order to succeed has to walk paths that are distanced from the core point. It's necessary to go far to reach for what is near. The reader can imagine a library where after a hurricane has left all the books spread out on the floor, a person who cannot see is asked to place all the volumes back on the shelves. The person can fulfill the task using only the hands, but only an incredible luck would assure that the books are placed in on the correct shelves. This is how this mystery started out. Everything was out of place. Fiction and reality are so intertwined that the most rational and objective being would feel completely lost. Buying a book does not give us the power to know the truth, as if it was a chip that is implanted in us right after we pass the checkout and pay for a heap of leaves and a binder. Buying a book means that we have the key to open the door into something that will make us think. After that, then will come knowledge. Here and now, please do think. To the men and women at the Criminal Investigation Department in Portimao, at the Faro Directory and at the Central Directory for the Combat Against Banditism of the Policia, Policia Judiciaria, 
to those who carry on their shoulders the difficult mission of answering the questions of where, when, how, who, what, and why. Paolo Pereira Cristovao. So guys, this is the foreword for the book. Uh, let me say uh, hi to a couple of you over here in the chat before we move on to chapter one. Hi, Claire. Thank you so much for joining. Hi, Gary. Hi, Jay. And I have a comment from Gary here. I don't think Maddie fell behind the couch. I think something sexual and violent killed Maddie and she was hidden behind the couch. Pain being a main suspect. Yeah, this is, a, this is a very plausible theory. All right, let me set up the, the first chapter. Let's see here, chapter one. So chapter one is called The Phone Call of a Lifetime. Francisco Mereles, a PJ inspector who is working at the Criminal Investigation Department in Portimao, receives a call after half past 11 p.m. He is summoned to the Ocean Club in Praia da Luz, where an English girl has gone missing. When Mereles arrives at the Ocean Club, he sees two GNR vehicles on location, as well as the car that belongs to his chief, Fao Tavares. Several dozens of people were gathered near apartment 5A, which was completely lit, just like the ones above it. People are at the windows and walking in and out of the apartment. Mereles' chief, Juan Tavares, calls out to him. They enter the apartment while Tavares explains the situation to Mereles. The main door to the easily accessible ground floor apartment had been left unlocked with three children inside while their parents had been dining at the tapas bar. Mereles notices that the, that the apartment has not been isolated to preserve the traces of a possible presence of one or more abductors. The furniture is impeccably aligned against the walls as if someone had tried to make as much room as possible in the center of the living room. Which to me kind of, uh, you know, when I, when I was reading this uh, phrase, it, I was kind of imagining in my head like when uh, you are in an emergency room and you are a patient and you are on the bed and they are kind of working uh, on you to save your life or something like that, where everything is clear out of the way and uh, you only have the, the bed there in the middle, right? So let me carry on. In the bedroom, the bed where the child was sleeping is on the opposite side of the window. Under the window, there is another bed, which had not been in use. Whomever entered through the window would have left foot marks on the bed, which in that position resembled a trap. But that had not happened. Pao Tavares phones Gonzalo Amaral, the coordinator of the CID in Portimao. His presence on the scene indicates that the situation is serious, as this is not common procedure. Mereles goes to speak with Mrs. McCann. I assume that's Kate McCann. Her eyes do not meet his all the time, and she seems to be somewhat distanced from the situation, but the inspector doesn't make judgments, as his experience tells him that people have very different reactions under stressful situations. He remains intrigued by Kate. Tavares and Mereles collect informal statements from the other members of the group, the Paynes, O'Brien and Tanner, the Oldfields, and Mrs. Webster. They, they all initially transmit the notion that during the meal, they got up from the table at several occasions to check upon the children. Mereles notices some discrepancies. While some members of the group say that they checked on their own children and on the other children as well, others said that each checked on their own. Jerry, the child's father, looked more disoriented than the mother. Jerry seemed to be electrical, organizing search parties to look for the child that might have walked out of the apartment on her own. 
throughout the entire scene, the twins slept undisturbed. They were eventually carried away into another ap apartment and never woke up. Tavares reappears, now in the company of Amaral and Guillermino Encarnasao, the head of the directory in Faro. Francisco Meireles discovers that the child's parents have already phoned to England, asking for the intervention of friends, both within the government and the media. Guillermino had been informed of the situation by the national director, who had been called by the British ambassador in Portugal. Mereles cannot help but wonder about the priorities, given the fact that those who are closer to the scene can help more rapidly than those who are far away in the United Kingdom. So, okay, we finished with chapter number one. And what do we think so far? I kind of like the way that uh, he narrates to start with. But, you know, so far we don't know anything that we didn't know already. All right, uh, let me set up chapter number two. And uh, chapter number two is called Abduction with a question mark. Can I not move this? Oh no, I can't. Okay. Okay. As the hours pass, the groups of volunteers continue to search the area. The resort is unprotected from strangers. Apart from the central leisure area, which is gated, the buildings have no porter or security that guard it from strangers. As time goes on, the possibility of an abduction grows stronger over the possibility that the child could have wandered away on her own and suffered an accident. In the early morning, the PJ inspectors call in reinforcements from GNR with sniffer dogs. Mereles is now convinced that this is an abduction and that only a request for a ransom would yield more information. If the abductor didn't make contact soon, the outcome of the case looked grim. In the CID in Portimao, data is being collected and processed. Meanwhile, Luis Neves, the director of the Central Combat of Banditism Directory in Lisbon, joins the core group of investigators. On the same day, the policemen were confronted with the will of parents of the parents to publicize their daughter's face as much as possible, which, which is usual in their own country. They were completely convinced that Madeline had been abducted and would not move an inch away from that theory. Mereles thinks their theory makes as much sense as any other. What does not make sense is that they left their children in an apartment out of sight, out of their control, to go out and dine with friends. In the meantime, the inspector had been at the tapas bar. He had been sitting at the table where the group had also, had also been and he had talked to the waiters. They had told him that the group usually drank significant amounts of alcohol. On the night that Madeline disappeared, they had consumed 12 bottles of wine and some appetizers. The investigators have gathered informal statements and they start to compare them. They soon realize that something is wrong. The couple's friends stated that they got up several times to check on the children while the waiters from the tapas bar say they did not get up that often at all. But even within the group of friends, there are contradictions. As time passes, Francisco almost definitely abandons the theory that the child could have left the apartment on her own. Two possibilities remain, a kidnapping for ransom or an abduction for PDF. The third possibility was that someone inside the group could have been involved in the disappearance. Francisco did not want to bet on that theory yet. The media wave that has invaded Prada Luz in the meantime looks like a bad prediction for the destiny of the child, my Mereles thinks. 
The excessive publicity could lead to her death, as the abductor could be prompted into acting by eliminating the only person that could lead to his identification if he were to be caught. The coordinator of the CID tries to convince the parents not to launch a massive media campaign, but the parents remain unmoved. Two different approaches to a criminal investigation have their first clash. <coughs> Excuse me. Two English people, one of them, Jane Tanner, say that they saw a man carrying a child that could be the missing infant. The description given by Jane is very vague and carries a factor of doubt as Jerry and the friend whom he was talking to, standing on the same location as Jane when she passed, saw nobody. The friend confirmed this. At the time that Jane says she saw the man, Jerry had just left the apartment. Francisco cannot conceive that an abductor would have been waiting for this visitor in order to enter through the door or the window right under the father's nose to carry out the child and to walk around with her in his arms down the streets. Francisco can only conclude that this was not how it happened. A criminal would not risk taking the child under such circumstances so many variables out of his control. He would need five or six accomplices to control the situation, which is simply too much trouble to abduct, to abduct a small girl. Okay, we are done with chapter two and Gary is saying, what do the Mokians know about people high up in the UK government that gets them full protection and cover up from this government? Well, uh, in my opinion, they must know something or they are involved in something because, you know, they are science people and the whole group is kind of like part of the medical community. Uh, I don't know, but something is really strange here. And I think that it's, it has something to do with their profession i don't know mm -hmm. let's go to chapter number Chapter number three, this is called The Most Simple Hypothesis. Francisco Mereles reflects upon the material that he has compiled about the case so far. He knows that the most simple, simple explanations have to be exhausted before the more complicated theories can be considered. He looks at the possibility that the explanation for the disappearance of the child lies within that group of people. The contradictions in their statements about the event of about the events of that late afternoon and evening could be due to the stress of the situation, but they could also indicate something else. Francisco tries to keep it simple. What if the child was involved in a domestic accident? Something went wrong here in this third world country. Nobody would believe it was just an accident. We would spend years and years in jail. What about our reputation, the children, our families? It's done now, let's live with it and adapt to the situation. For Francisco, everything fits, but all other possibilities have to be discarded first. This should be the last one, as it is the most difficult and the most hideous one. The participation of the parents in the disappearance of their daughter. As a father, he finds it hard to believe, but statistics support the possibility. While it seems the most simple hypothesis to him, Francisco knows it will be the one that may become the most difficult to investigate and prove. Francisco returns to the location at 3.30 a.m. when the reporters are not around. He stands on the street where Jane Tanner was walking that night. He tries to imagine Jerry talking to his friend near the little gate. Where would an abductor park his car? It's possible to park close to the window of the bedroom, but the area is completely visible from the balconies of other apartments. I don't think so. PDFs have a huge market in the Eastern European countries where they can buy children without major hassles. The sexual predator does not like to take chances. He carefully studies the situation and here 
there wasn't enough time for that. Less than a week with people who are enjoying themselves free of schedules and routines. And how would someone know when there would be checks on the children? How lucky that person would have to be not to be caught by the comings and goings and to enter and leave the apartment unseen. So many factors out of control just do not seem to fit the profile of a cold calculating PDF, no matter how excited he was about his prey. Even if he was a PDF who had acted without a plan, this would be precisely the type of situation that would have left traces, yet absolutely nothing had been found. It makes no sense at all. The twins would have been taken if this was a case of illegal adoption. The parents' past offers no clues to a crime of vengeance. Francisco tries to think about all the aspects. He cannot understand the relationship between Malinka and Murat and the phone call between them that night. What if something happened late that afternoon that only the family knows about? The twins sleeping like champions, yet nobody takes them. A guy took advantage of the intervals between the checks and risked taking the child away who could have woken and started crying for her parents? It makes no sense. Hi, Vian. Thank you so thank you so much for joining. Yeah, I'm doing well. How are you? Yes, Gary, I agree with you. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next chapter. Chapter number four. A madman in Lisbon. More than a month has gone by since Madeline disappeared. The media pressure on the investigators is stronger than ever. The British government stands firmly beside the McCanns, like he has, he has since the first moment, just like the British media. Lots of information was coming in from all sides, but one received special attention from the investigators at one point. Chief Juan Tavares rings up Francisco Mereles, telling him that a Dutch newspaper has received a map that supposedly shows the location of the child's body and the lead is being taken seriously. Francisco meets his chief and two Dutch journalists who, had been, who have been in Portugal for three days, <coughs> excuse me, trying to find out the location of the place that is marked on the map. They even hired sniffer dogs. Francisco and Juan Tavares feel like arresting them on the spot for endangering the investigation. But the lead has to be verified. The journalists, take an envelope out of their bag and they produce a document that they say had been received together with a map. It's a spermogram, a document that is issued when someone has his sperm analyzed in a lab. Juan Tavares notices that there is no identification of the subject on the document, but he also notices a sequence of numbers on the lower right-hand corner. He contacts a doctor who informs him that the sequence identifies the lab, the number of the test, and the individual that was subject to the analysis. Therefore, while other colleagues go to Odiazere, followed by a trail of journalists, Paul Tavares and Francisco Mereles go to Lisbon, where they identify the individual who turns out to be a public servant, divorced, and with evident problems of self-assurance and self-regulation. The man confesses that all he wanted to do was to help keep the case in the media spotlight and that he will seek psychiatric help. Paul Tavares calls into the Algarve and informs his chiefs of the results from Lisbon, which prompts the diligences in Odiaxer to be stopped. The journalists who are on location don't understand why the searches lasted only two hours. The area is so vast that they expect it to have news and live reports going for days. They are wrong, basing themselves on the judgment of those who have no competence in the investigation and do not comprehend its development. Oh, I forgot to put this one on the screen. So sorry, guys. 
Okay, I finish with the chapter, with that chapter. And now we are going to chapter number five. And this time I'm not going to forget. So, so sorry, guys. So, so sorry. Okay. So chapter number five, the inversion of things. On the 13th of July, Madeline's father attended a ceremony where prizes were delivered to the most brave police officers of his country. During that ceremony, Jerry sent two types of sentence into two directions, which while diverging were targeted at the same profession. He praised the precious effort of the English policemen who were participating in the investigation into the disappearance of his daughter and thanked the commitment and cooperation of the Portuguese policemen. Presuming that the investigation was the responsibility of the Portuguese police and the public ministry, which directed the process, and that the English policemen were in Portugal because they had been authorized by their Portuguese colleagues, then it's only fair to suggest that the precious effort should have been applied to the Portuguese. And commitment and cooperation are words that should have been used to refer to their British counterparts. Jerry McCann's words illustrate what so many Portuguese, especially those who live and work in the south of the country, feel. That the Algarve has become a little England where the offices of GNR might as well replace the picture of the president that hangs on the wall of the chief's office with one of Queen Elizabeth II. But the fact is that this is those cooperating and committed investigators from the PJ that are trying to solve this case. They do not obey the British crown. It was not only the words, but rather other actions from the McCanns, who since the beginning were surrounded by media advisors, spokespeople, an ambassador, and the prime minister who were available 24 hours per day and the favorable press that offended the Portuguese. The notion subsisted that the McCanns felt like the Portuguese who go to the Dominican Republic for their holidays. Everything is fine unless there is a problem. Oh, this was a very short chapter. So let me see the next one. What chapter did I just read? Oh, yes, the inversion of things. Okay, uh, our next one is chapter number six. Death, said Krugel, Eddie, and Kila. The month of July marks a turnaround in the case. A former South African policeman, Daniel Krugel, offers to help the investigation at no cost. He is an investigator at the uh, SA University and claims to have invented an equipment that is able to detect the presence of DNA from a specific person. The PJ welcomes his help as the investigation is facing an imminent standstill. Krugel stays in Praia da Luz for almost a week and writes a report that demolishes the abduction theory. Madeline had been killed. Her body had been, or still is, at Praia da Luz. He informs the police and the McCanns about the results and returns to his country, refusing to discuss his findings. This is how he's decided to send for two dogs from England. Eddie is trained to detect traces of the presence of a cadaver at any location, while Kila is trained to detect minuscule traces of blood. They have solved over 200 homicide cases together and their credibility has never been questioned. On the last day of July, the intuition of the investigators and the results from Krugel find two powerful allies that confirmed the scenario that had begun to form, the death of Madeleine McCann on the evening of May the 3rd. Eddie's handler opens the door to apartment 5A and lets the dog in to walk freely as usual. The dog sniffs around, followed by his handler, the policeman, experts from the scientific police, and the video technician who registered the procedure on tape. 
At a given moment in the living room, Eddie signals the presence of a cadaver to his handler. According to the laws of forensics, it's a cadaver that has been in that condition for at least two hours. Francisco feels like he has been betrayed. It simply does not seem possible for a stranger to have killed a child inside the apartment, remaining on location for one and a half to two hours at least. But while his mind is swirling with thoughts, his heart is filled with sadness as it becomes evident that Madeline will never be recovered alive. On the next day, it is Kila who is put into action. After several minutes sniffing around the house, she detains herself next to a sofa in the living room. The investigators move the sofa aside and Kila shows them two tiny spots of dry blood, one on the floor, the other one on the wall. The material is collected and the decision is made against the opinion of Francisco and Juan Tavares. The samples are sent into a lab in Birmingham. On the next day, early in the morning, Eddie, Eddie is called back to service to investigate the surroundings of the apartment. The dog stops here and there, making a path that is referenced by apartment 5A and the Beach of Luz. Without knowing, Eddie has just confirmed Krugel's findings. The only problem with these witnesses is that they cannot testify in court, and none of the work that any of the three, Krugel, Eddie, and Kila had done, would be used in a trial in Portugal. If those methods are valid in other developed countries, why can't they be admissible in Portugal? Francisco questions. The same dogs whose effective, effectiveness and training had been decisive in the past to confirm the condemnation of dozens of criminals abroad would soon be questioned because they had allegedly been prompted to make up results that contradicted the theory of an abduction by a stranger. Hi, Saffron, thank you for joining. Oh, Saffron is saying I don't live very far from Rothley. Have you seen Kate and Jerry McCann? Yeah, I'm with you guys, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. In my opinion, there is uh, something much bigger at play here than just uh, simple doctors. Okay, let's move on to chapter number seven. Kila and Eddie versus McCann. Francisco is in his office, still trying to get some ideas into order when in mid-August he does a rewind of the last two weeks of the investigation. These two canines, without knowing it, were at the core of a volcano when in three separate moments they accused Madeline's parents of at least not saying the whole truth about what happened to their daughter. First, when they were given plenty of time and space, to sniff through Robert Murat's house and all of his belongings and did not discover anything that could minimally incriminate him. Second, when they detected the odor of death on the key of the car that they used, which was rented more than 20 days after the little girl went missing, in the same car where they found traces of blood and hair under the spare tire. Third, when already in the new house where the couple was staying, Eddie once again smelled the characteristic odor of death on a pair of jeans and on a blouse that belonged to Kate. The soft toy that the mother carried with her every time they went out also presented a smell of death that, that was detected by the same dog. What the heck do we have here then? He thought intrigued. Did the parents stage this entire circus to hide the truth? Were they or only one of them responsible for the death of the child whose cadaver they, re they readily concealed? 
If the dogs are never wrong, I think that the result stands at three to zero for the dogs. Now, all we need is to transform the team of dogs into PJ inspectors, he joked to himself. The truth was that the, the, that the dogs had supplied precious elements to work upon, but which were not enough to build a formal accusation against anyone on their own. It was important information on which a theory should be built, something that was not looking easy at all for the investigators. The McCanns had set a propaganda machine into motion unlike any other that had ever been seen worldwide. In spite of the fact that they had assembled the best and most expensive experts within every area of communication, it looked like not even the couple expected such a result. This case had reached planetary dimensions and hundreds of credulous people stated daily that they had seen Madeline now in, Mo in Malta, then in Morocco, Spain, Italy, Belgium, and all over the world. A popular saying tells us that the higher the rise, the bigger the fall, and the disaster was proportional to the size that the phenomenon had acquired in the meantime. That was seen when, on the 6th of September, the investigators decided to confront the couple with what they had discovered in the meantime. Those who applauded started jeering. Those who supported turned their backs. Mass, mass psychology explains what is behind these abrupt changes in opinion. In reality, this happens not because those opinions are properly structured or based on secure foundations, but rather on feelings that invade those who felt the disappearance of Madeline as if he was a close relative. Therefore, it's only natural that the sense of popular opinion changes according to the dominating feeling of the moment. And when it's like this, one cannot demand rationalism where it never existed in the first place. Hey, Bernadette, thank you for joining. Well, uh, you have missed a couple of chapters of the reading of the book. Okay, so our next chapter will be chapter number eight. Right. This chapter is called Accused. Shortly after 2 p.m., Kate sits down on a chair in a room that has been specially prepared at the PJ's department in Portimao. Paul Tavares sits down in front of her. The strategy is to work in a crescendo, starting out calmly, working towards an emotional peak, hoping for the witness to explode and confess. For the umpteenth time, the events of that late afternoon are remembered, more precisely, the time lapse between half six and 8.30 p.m. Madeline's mother insists on the same usual reply. We arrived, I played with the children in the apartment's living room, I prepared them to go to bed, and by 7.30 they were actually asleep. We dressed up and went to dinner with our friends. Actually, Paul Tavares says in a calm and pondered tone, we think that some domestic accident happened in that house which was covered up for fear of the consequences of wrong interpretations by the police or by the people about your life. You ended up staging this entire abduction situation. You wanted to maintain your reputation of perfect medical couple at all costs, didn't you? Then prove it, Kate throws in a dry manner. Only someone who is guilty says prove it. We detected blood traces in the living room, madam. That could have been from the day that my daughter bled from her nose. We found blood in your rented car. That could have come from a piece of the girl's clothing that could have been dirty with her blood and then transported in the car. It certainly could. Let's have a look at this video then. On the TV monitor, Eddie can be seen sniffing over Kate's clothing and marking that he had been in contact with a cadaver. The reactions of the dogs in the vehicle that had been used by Madeline's parents can also be seen. 
at the medical center where I work in England, before we came on holidays, people died whom I had been in contact with. You must be forgetting that I'm a doctor. Yes, you are, Hua Tavares replies. And the death rate at the medical center where you work twice a week is extremely high. It's true, the Argida replies. Did you ever give your children any medicine to make them sleep? No, never, she replies with indignation. This was a rhetorical question as it was known that Kate's father had stated that it was usual for them to give the children calpol to sleep. For hours, the questions followed one another and Kate reached emotional peaks several times. A confession is proposed to her with the explanation that the penal context is more favor favorable in such cases. This is done to ensure that an exit is offered to a person who is feeling trapped. The entire situation is explained so the potential criminal does not feel that there are still secrets in store that could compromise him or her. Madeline's mother is confronted with everything that there is for eight hours. All the inconsistencies in the witness statements, the timings of the alleged checks on the apartment, the drinks that were consumed at dinner. She did not give in. She was even indignant about certain questions. She never broke or recognized any guilt except for the one that she felt about leaving her children alone in the apartment while she went to dinner. At this point, Paul Tavares thinks she's either a great actress or she's completely innocent. Kate leaves the PJ department in Portimao, in Portimao as an Algida. Pinto de Abro, who is well aware of the crucial role of the media, makes a statement about his client's status in the process. Kate and Jerry had been made Algidos and the latter shows himself a lot less available to reply to any questions. The investigators are well aware of what they say and of the choices that they were making, but destiny did not leave them any other options. Until here, all the questions that had been asked from the McCanns would find an appropriate reply and a plausible explanation, which gave the couple complete innocence. Everything was circumstantial, and there was nothing definitive against them. A few hours later, the Policia Judiciaria is informed that the McCanns will return to their home in England to be reunited with the rest of their family. They know that by doing so, public opinion can only conclude in their ingenuity that they were escaping a possible detention out of fear. I know, right, Gary? Who would say something like that? Exactly. It's just the way that she's answering whatever questions she's answering when she's answering them. Right, let me see the next chapter. Chapter nine, chapter nine, here it goes. Sorry, it's taking me a while because I have to open the blog posts one by one for each chapter. Right, so chapter nine is the science and the cunning. Francisco is working in the room that is dedicated to the Madeleine McCann case. His chief, Juan Tavares, enters the room and asks whether there have been any results about the forensics tests from Britain. There has not been a word, and they both realize that the case will drag on for months. Tavares adds that it's better to wait for months for the results from England, because if the tests had been done in Portugal, there would be accusations of ruining the material, or even worse, of manipulation of the test results. At the moment, all they have is a partially positive DNA match, meaning it could belong either to Madeline or to her siblings or to her mother. They decide to drive into Luz one more time. On the way, they discuss the dismissal of Gonzalo Amaral from the case. Paul Tavares notes that the police is starting to rely too much on lab, on lab test results, CSI style, 
and that they risk forgetting what made the PJ one of the most respected police forces in the world. Their cunning ways, the manner in which they manage to improvise and trust their intuition. He says they have to take the best from both worlds, to use the advances of science that can help them, but that they should never be transformed into pure scientists and that they should never give up their way of life, eating and drinking well, just because the Brits think is not appropriate. Francisco noticed that his chief was upset about what had happened to Gonzalo Amaral, who had been targeted by the British media with the sole purpose of getting him removed from the case. It seemed like the Portuguese way of investigating had become old fashioned and that now they were supposed to adopt the British style. Francisco felt uncomfortable with the pressures that they had suffered lately to adapt to the ways of the British. It was not that they were better or worse, it was that they were different. But as a young policeman, Francisco knew that it was better for him to open his ears and close his mouth, unlike his superior. The last few months had been complicated. The case had slowed down and the colleagues from Lisbon, who had been called in as reinforcements, had returned home. All the available leads had been explored with no results and the British media mocked the Portuguese police with insults and humiliation, but the police itself never defended their men by adopting a strong stance. The public ministry refused to take any chances contrary to the style of the police, who knew that calculated risk and boldness had to be used in the appropriate measures. The best moments of Portuguese history had been due to those who were not afraid of taking their chances. Francisco had learned from his older colleagues that science and cunning can coexist within criminal investigation. He knew that not always the best decisions had been made. One of the most serious mistakes to him was that the Parliament 5A had not been immediately isolated. Meanwhile, the child's parents had returned home. Francisco saw two possible explanations for the fact. They either saw that their position within the process could become more serious soon, or they thought that they could defend themselves better from their home country. Although Francisco tried not to read what the papers, not to read what the papers wrote about the case, the truth was that he had noticed the support movement that the Portuguese people had formed around that couple. Those people, he thought, must have must have felt somewhat betrayed by the McCanns leaving the country so suddenly. Talking with his friends, Francisco had seen confirmation of his own thoughts, that the excess of advisors, the staged exits of the couple from their house, the walks on the beach, the soft toy in the mother's hands, all that had been made, had maybe been done with the best of intentions. But it conveyed the notion that it was actually a marketing operation that had been promoted to whitewash any guilt of the parents in their daughter's disappearance. Francisco had yet to form a definite, definite idea about what had really happened on the evening of May the 3rd in Pride. Time was not helping to clarify what happened to the little girl. Absorbed into his thoughts, Francisco had not noticed that his chief rambled on. Can you see that, Francisco? We will reach the end of this story and we will be seen as incompetent. And maybe there are guys who are right when they say we spend too much time going over the abduction theory but what were we supposed to do? Was there a reason to suspect a group of doctors on holidays in the Algarve with their children and, and everything? This shit is in a state where it's impossible that they are all telling the truth. Someone is lying. This is from the books, boy. If about a certain reality, there are different versions, then at least one of them is failing the truth. We have yet to find out which one and whether it's being done on purpose or simply because someone is mistaken. Francisco knows that his chief is talking about the inconsistencies in the witness statements. They do not match. The actions, the timings, the times do not fit. Everything is wrong. It may not be realistic to ask someone to remember the exact times at which one has performed one's actions, but one should surely be able to remember how often a certain action has been performed, especially when it's asked the very next day. Can science clarify everything? Francisco takes his chances and risks sharing with his chief that he thinks the police has spent too much time on a theory that had been imposed on them from the outside in instead of relying on their own work. The abduction theory had been instituted from the beginning 
and only when it had been explored a million times until not the tiniest possibility remained, had the police allowed themselves to look at other hypotheses. The case should have been worked their way, no matter how many TV cameras and journalists surrounded them. Paul Tavares has to agree. The investigation had only advanced when they had finally followed their own way of working. While they were searching for PDF abductors, they had not advanced a single step. They had wasted precious time looking for ghosts that lasted only two days, like the case of the sailor. The newspapers were running wild covering the story of a mysterious sailor who had left the marina with a child in his boat, and the police had already searched the man's boat over a week earlier in Villa Real de, San, de Santo Antonio. There had also been those poor people who had stopped at the gas station with their niece. The media were all over the issue with the actual persons had been interviewed several days later, earlier. Abstaining from judging the parents of the missing child, Tavares can't help but to state that on the day that the police had stopped following the theory which was imposed on them, all the clues pointed at the same group of persons. Advisors or no advisors, more Gordon Brown or less. The truth was that they had been directed. Francisco proposes that they set science aside for a moment then and look once more at the scene while he drives the car along the road that connects the house of Robert Murat to the apartment 5A. Gary is saying uh, the Portuguese police are not stupid. They know the McCanns are involved, so they must know the UK government are covering up for the McCanns. Yes, I th I think they do. I think they know that. And Gary is also saying, sorry if I'm ranting a bit, but this really boils my blood that they are getting away with this. I know. I think that uh, all of us feel the same as you do. It's just unbelievable. It's just, it's incredible. So, guys, we've been at this for an hour now. Um, I'm going to take a five minutes break and then we will carry on with the rest. And uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to carry on with one more hour and then uh, we can pick it up some other time. But for now, guys, don't go anywhere. It's just going to be like a five minute break because I really need to use the loo. Sorry. And uh, then I'll be back. In the meantime, maybe grab yourselves a coffee or tea or you know whatever if you want to drink i'm also very thirsty and i need something to drink okay i'm gonna turn off my cam and i'll be back in five minutes guys
Okay, guys, I'm back. <clears throat> Let's catch up on some of the comments. Hi, Jennifer. Jennifer is saying, hi, Kat, this is really interesting. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining. Gary is saying, I, don't, I honestly don't believe Maddy fell. I think something has happened to her. Yes, I kind of agree with that as well. Saffron, off to grab a coffee. Enjoy. I had the sip as well. Coffee and then water. Gary saying the photo of Maddie with the makeup on tells its own story. I yes, Gary, I have to agree with you. That that photo is just it's it's just very disturbing. I don't know. I mean, I get that uh, you know girls they usually like to play with makeup and stuff like that, but there's just something about that photo which is just. I don't know, I find it very disgusting. Not in the sense that uh, I find Madeline disgusting, but rather the way that the photo was taken with the makeup and I don't know, it's just, it's creepy. Okay, so you guys were chatting here between uh, each other about uh, PDF ring. It might be more than that. I, I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, David Payne and Jerry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's carry on with our next chapter. Chapter number 10, The Inconveniences of Logics. The two policemen leave the car and look around them. It's sunny, although it's October already. There are a few people at the Ocean Club and it looks like nothing had ever happened there. They walk the road that connects Murat's house to the corner of the apartment block where the McCann family had been staying. They try to imagine the scenario of that evening with the children asleep in the apartments while the adults enjoy themselves in the restaurant. They decide that one of them will defend the abduction theory while the other one will defend the possibility that something happened within that group of people, more specifically inside the McCann's apartment. Francisco gets to defend the abduction thesis while the chief gets the other theory. Francisco tries to recollect everything that he has learned over these past months. Well, we are a happy family. Our lives are good. We have no major financial difficulties. We are instructed people. We are doctors, as a matter of fact. We have three beautiful children. We don't have enemies. We arrived here a week ago with our friends who are also enjoying a good life. Some of our friends are also doctors and they are equally happy. We all like to put the children to bed early and to go out to have a few drinks. We are staying at a resort in the Algarve where we enjoy the day with the children. And in the evening, the kids go to bed as it's time for mommy and daddy to have some fun. Francisco continues, we went to dinner that evening, leaving our children who had been asleep since 7.30. An hour later, we were sitting at the table with our friends who had equally left their children asleep in their bedrooms. We left the door unlocked in case there might be an emergency. At some point, shortly after 9 p.m., the father went to the apartment and did not see his daughter where she had been sleeping, but he thought that she might be in the parents' bedroom. He didn't check if that was the case. Their friend Russell also went to check on his children, but he returned only an hour later at the time when Kate, the mother, went into apartment 5A and did not find her daughter. Hence the despair. The child had been abducted by some stranger who had entered the bedroom and had taken her. This is it, Chief. Paul Tavares replies, let's see. According to the neighbor upstairs, mother and daughter had been yelling at each other. It seems that the child was hyperactive. The parents, despite the fact that they are doctors with three small children, didn't bring any medication, not even a single tablet for a headache, or at least we didn't see any. There were babysitters on offer for free, but they were dismissed that evening for whatever reason. Among the group of friends, there are checks to suit every taste according to their statements. 
every 15 minutes, every half an hour, etc. Some only check on their own, others check on all of the children, others only listen at the door. In the case of the twins, they didn't even need to bother, they simply could not wake up, even in the midst of the turmoil that was generated that night. The caring mother told the neighbor upstairs that the police had been called when the alarm was raised, but she was lying. The first people that called the GNR were the employees of the Ocean Club. The same neighbor said she never saw the mother in a panic, which would be normal for a mother under the circumstances. As far as I know, nobody ever said that the lady was lying. The father, who was a lot more worried about gathering support in England, made one phone call after another, which were more political than anything else. And why was the child's father wandering around in the early hours of the morning asking for the way to the church when he had passed it so many times on the way to the beach? And why did the English friends immediately send out the marketing and public relations heavyweight experts? Hmm? And if there were that many checks, when was the break that allowed the abductor to enter the apartment? And then there is the mother saying that someone entered through the children's bedroom windows, but the GNR people said that the shutters had never been forced. And then there are the doggies that never missed a case over 200 times and now supposedly have got it all wrong. Francisco replies that his chief's reasoning is correct, but nobody can be condemned over lying or for failing to present coherent explanations for events. Pau Tavares smiles at the young colleague and replies that is not always that way. In fact, he can remember a few cases. Francisco asks him to present his version then. Let's see, Francisco, you marry a woman from a social standing that is above you. You had to work very hard to deserve her, both socially and financially. The family didn't like you very much, but they eventually accepted you being a Catholic and all. You have three children. You are the perfect family. You have worked yourself so far up, you are even about to enter the government. Life is running smoothly and the path seems to lead all the way up. But then something happens, a domestic accident. We are in a third world country. Someone will think this bunch of barbarians will never believe how it happened. What do we do now? A father taking care of his two children while the wife spends time in jail there? This cannot be. Whom do we call? The emergency services? No. The police? No way. The best thing to do is to call England as help is there, not here. We just went out to dinner and when we looked again, she wasn't there. Now you go looking for our daughter's abductor because our only crime was to go for dinner at a location where we could not see our apartment, believing that in spite of the fact that the apartment is on the ground floor next to a public road, we were not at risk or rather our children were not at any risk. Paul Tavares continues. Half the world thinks like this, Francisco, and the other half thinks a predator was watching them and chose the right time to take little Madeline out of her bed. The fact is that it was precisely them who made us consider the possibility that this story was badly told. They worried about their image far too soon. At no time did they consider the possibility that the child could have left the apartment on her own, got lost and fell into a ditch or something. Abduction only abduction and they have taken her. This leads me to another possibility, which is that the parents know that this is an abduction that was carried out by someone and that for a reason, they cannot say more than what they have already said. In reality, when we reach this point, it seems like nothing has been decided yet in this game. Don't you agree? Francisco does agree, but he also thinks that the parents are guilty of the crime of exposure or abandonment according to the Portuguese Penal Code, Article 138. Paul Tavares notes, he was one of those that defended that the parents should have been made arguidos from the beginning, but superior orders were that the parents were to be kept in a situation where they would cooperate with police. Only results would later confirm whether this had been the right choice or not. He is well aware of the responsibility that he and his colleagues carry. 
The whole world is looking at them, waiting to hear what happened to Madeline. Tavares knows that if only logics were to be applied to this case, he would have been solved on the night of May the 3rd. The child had been abducted while she was asleep in the apartment, and that was it. The next step was to find the abductor, and after his identity had been clarified, he would be traced, and so would Madeline. This was logics. But the secret was in the investigator's mental exercise, in his capacity to abstain from preconceived notions and to look solely at the matter that had been determined. It's not easy as it's about human beings trying to discover in other human beings something that they are trying to hide at all costs. Here the weapons are equal and the rest doesn't matter. The two policemen walk up the street from the supermarket back to apartment 5A. They try to imagine Jerry talking to his friend and they also try to imagine a person walking across the top of the street towards a car or a house. They try to imagine the couple's friend passing the same spot, watching the abductor calmly committing the crime and walking away from the apartment. Jerry should have seen the man. More so, Jerry should have seen his friend. It did not seem to be the case. They both speak about the situation when they are both on the same location with no pedestrian movement around them at a time when most people are having dinner and each of them seems to observe a different scenario. How can the human mind be interpreted under such circumstances? One fights for yes, the other fights for no. One of them is definitely lying. They may both be lying even with the best of intentions or both may be telling their truth. The one that is real to each of them, even when one lies, is not always with intention. We are only human and these things do happen. The compassion that the parents provoked on public opinion deviated the attentions from the fact that the least that they did was to leave three small children on their own in an apartment that was easily accessible from the outside. That same compassion was the ultimate enemy of those who should have looked at the case without any emotions. These policemen are well aware that the path that led them to the possibility of the group of people knowing more than they were saying was the most difficult one. They had restlessly pursued every single lead, every small clue until the limits of reason, drying them all out until only one possibility was left standing. Truth was that although the investigation didn't take the direction that so many people wanted it to take, it had gained its own life and taken a specific route with the input from Krugel, from the dogs, from the analysis of the witness statements, from the lab test results. It was not the policemen through their own will or because they wanted to hatch a conspiracy plan against the McCanns, but rather specific data that had pointed the investigation into a certain direction. This was now the drama of these policemen. What should they do? Give up and archive the case? That was not even a possibility, as the values at stake were even higher than the personal and professional pride or the reputation of the PJ. What had been the destiny of a child that had been taken out of her normal life with her siblings? These policemen know that no matter how long it takes, the answer will appear. Wow, this was quite a long chapter. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, Saffron is saying, I believe they were being instructed by government officials on step by step on what to do and when. I believe the Mukhans were assisted by some who were sent over to Luz to assist in the disposal. Yes, that makes a lot of sense, actually. It, it makes sense because from the beginning, they made those phone calls. They contacted all these people. From the very first night, they started contacting people, which you, you don't really see in other cases where genuinely a child has been abducted. And then, again, another thing is, like he said uh, right now in this chapter, 
that uh, they rather wanted to distract the public's attention from the fact that they they actually put in danger their three children by leaving them alone. And again, like he was mentioned, they should have been charged even in Portugal for abandonment and endangerment. But uh, I think uh, reading from some other sources, I can't remember where I was reading this, but I think that if they would have uh, charged the McCanns for uh, abandonment or you know endangering the children, then possibly they couldn't have been charged for uh, the role they had in Madeline's abduction. So it was kind of like, you know, choosing this or choosing that. Oh, Gary is saying, do you think the McCann's family know the truth? As in, you mean the immediate family? And Saffron is saying, yes, I do. Right, let's move on with our next chapter. Chapter number 11. The six fundamental questions. Where, when, how, who, what, and why. The six fundamental questions that an investigator should be able to answer when he reaches the end of a process remain in the air, The case, in the case of Aldea, Aldea Daluz. The two first ones were answered, although when still pointed to an excessively wide time lapse between half six in the evening, which was the time at which the McCanns had returned to the apartment and the child had been seen in public for the last time and 10 p.m., the time at which Madeline's mother cried out the alert. The how could have been answered if the versions that had been given by the people who had intervened matched minimally, which was not the case. The statements left wide open doors. Plus, the how question can be separated from the who, which widely explains what happened and how it happened. If it were true that the child had been taken out of her bed by a stranger, wouldn't it be normal to hear her cry out? Except if she were in such a deep sleep that she wasn't able to notice that she was being carried away in the arms of a stranger. The what and the why also have to be established together. When the specifics of an abduction, namely by a PDF, are being looked at, its motivation is explained from the beginning. Sexual, financial, or both. When a child goes missing without a trace, it's probably illicit to associate the parents to such a possibility. It was the parents themselves who expressed their will to participate in all the investigations that were performed to clarify this disappearance. When that same investigation confronted them with the inconsistencies of the reports that had been presented, why did they find that strange and rebelled against it? All the hypotheses must be placed on the table and they can only be excluded when they have been exhausted. The involvement of the parents in the disappearance was a possibility that still had a lot to explore. While the abduction theory always led to nowhere and seemed to hit a series of dead ends. The true drama of the McCanns and their entourage was that the investigation seemed to be going into a direction that was opposed to the one that they defended. This might as well be done in the best of intentions, but they should have allowed for all the lines of investigation to follow their own course. They may not always have been well advised about what to do or what to say. They hired many advisors, but failed to realize that the most important feature of the Portuguese people, that they unite for only a few causes. But when they do, they can give away the shirt that they are wearing. These remains of a Latin tradition of extremes of all or nothing collided with a risk and information management mach machine that was built from London. Through the eyes of those who avidly consumed every little piece of information about the case, the McCanns were transformed from parents who made a bad judgment about their children's safety into guilty persons in the disappearance of their daughter and into false people in the image that they wanted to give to the public. 
It was the same media machine that they summoned up to support their cause and to spread the word that turned against them and expelled them from Portugal. If nobody had known about the judicial status that they were given in early September 2007, they probably would not have left our country. Madeline's parents never concealed that they wanted the media on their side. They never conceived another possibility for the work of the Portuguese investigators apart from the one that they defended, that while they were dining, having left their children in what they considered to be a safe environment, an abductor entered the bedroom and kidnapped their daughter, taking her into Spain or Morocco. Why not in some region inside Portugal? After all, the probabilities that a Portuguese citizen had been the abductor were a lot greater than any other nationality. There are 10 million Portuguese and only a few hundred thousand foreigners in the country. Paulo Tavares tries to keep a schematic reasoning in these cases. Since he became a policeman, Paulo Tavares has used a mental scheme of analysis. But in this case, the scheme is more confused than ever before. Not because he lacks elements, but rather because there is an excess of them. An excess of information can paradoxically render itself useless. Although the clues point to a certain sequence of events, Paulo Tavares is unable to dismiss any of the hypotheses after all these months. The only possibility that he admits to set aside is that of the child leaving the apartment on her own. Keep it simple, he tells himself over and over again. But he was not allowed to, and the result was a huge mess of planetary dimensions. Every year, children disappear in Portugal, in the UK, in Spain, in France, all over the world. The explanations, no matter how gruesome, are usually simple. PDF predators, persons with sexual disturbances, abductions for ransom, abductions for human slavery, for illegal adoption, or children that, according to statistics, were subject to violence or to an incident within the family. Those are simple explanations exactly because they derive from the most basic and monstrous core of feelings that a human being is capable of. Self-preservation at any cost. Egoism, the need for absolute power, avarice, despise for others, hedonism. Paulo Tavares has always believed that the human being, no matter how educated and how instructed, no matter how polished in its image and in its manners, is capable of literally anything. Paulo Tavares reflected upon the fact that after so many centuries, the human race seemed to have evolved so little. We are capable of anything to preserve ourselves or to prevent us from losing the power that we have conquered in the meantime. He couldn't help the the regret that he felt over the fact that this case had been rendered a lot more complicated because at its beginning realities were assumed that should never have been. How were they to solve this mystery now? Okay, so where Ocean Club Apartment 5A, Prada Luz, when, May the 3rd, 2007, between half 6 and 10 p.m., how? Possibility, entrance through the door. Possibility, entrance through the window. Possibility, transported to another location alive. Transported to another location dead. Or unexpected action by another individual. Who? Stranger or relative or close group. What? Abduction by stranger or abduction by known person or death and concealment. Why? to hide relevant action or actions that derive from abduction. So these are the answers to the questions. Gary is asking, is it true Jerry McCann had a child sex conviction in 2002 that has been covered up? Well, apparently that's what I've been reading as well. And uh, apparently they got rid of the of whatever evidence that they had and the uh, registry, I think. 
but obviously considering that if uh, indeed it's true and they got rid of it then we can't really say one way or another you know okay let's see our next chapter Oh, I'm missing chapter 12. Oh. Yeah, sorry guys, chapter 12 is not here. So I'll have to jump on the next chapter, chapter 13 instead. Mm. Unless it's uh, chapter 12, but they misnumbered it, I'm not sure. The winding road to truth. Sorry, I need to grab a drink of water. I can't read anymore because my lips are so dry. So the winding road to truth. Those who persist always achieve, or almost always. Paul Tavares and Francisco Meirelles launch into an exercise that consists of finding and eliminating the possibilities that are contained within the mental scheme that both had drawn out in order to find an answer for each one of the four questions, instead of only trying to find the truth. They believe that by walking this route, the last remaining possibility will be the one that will be closest to the truth. Another issue is the material truth of the facts, which has to be proved in the criminal process. They return to the department in Portimao. They carefully examine dozens and dozens of papers, video surveillance tapes, written documents. In order to organize themselves in the midst of so much paper, they separate the documents that contain more sensitive information from those that contain merely bureaucratic text. We will presume that the dog wasn't wrong, okay, says Francisco. Maybe it arrived in the Algarve and got his uh, 201st case wrong. Paul Tavares replies with a funny smile. Well, Chief, what do you think about the notion that the body was in the living room where the dog detected the odor instead of one of the bedrooms? Wouldn't it have made more sense to hide it in a bedroom? That's right, Francisco, but what if something happened precisely in the living room and the body remained there until it was decided what to do with it? Just being there is not enough. It had to remain there for at least one and a half to two hours, Francisco concluded. Correct. And what did it take to get it out of there? At least to wait for darkness. If it was risky to take it out at night, then during the day it would have been madness. Paul Tavares finalizes. The two policemen conclude that there might have been an accident inside the apartment. There was no apparent reason for a voluntary crime. Maybe something unexpected happened and the parents decided that the best action would be not to assume the fact. It was a possibility that should be considered, taking into account the work of the English dog and also the work that had been done by the GNR sniffer dog that had detected the trail of Madeline between apartment 5A and another apartment and lost it there. The same English dog found a series of clues that led him to the beach at Luz, the beach where Krugel had found the presence of Madeline already a cadaver. The other dog detected small spots of blood in the living room, which the investigators could at least affirm that belonged to one of the three children of the McCann's. All of this put together gave them a vision that was not enough as evidence, but certainly as an indication, supported by the theory that the child had been killed inside the apartment, transported from there into another apartment, and then taken to the beach of Luz. The beach offered the sea as a possibility to conceal the body of Madeline, but the interior of the Algarve also offers countless possibilities for someone who wants to hide something to do so with relative ease and success. But then, Chief, what about the residues that the dogs detected 
inside the Renault Scenic, scenic Francisco questions. Well, that really messed the whole picture up because finding that type of residues in the area that is located just beneath the spare tire is a complicated matter. Come to think of it, it's not really that complicated or at least not to me. The chief replies smiling. Sure, Francisco continues. One thing is to transport clothing that might have carried traces from the child. They did move house twice after all, didn't they? Another entirely different matter is the location of the dog's findings, precisely the spot where one would hide things inside a car, right? In the cavity for the spare tire, more precisely beneath the tire. What a strange thing, Chief. Strange things happen here with the Portuguese Francisco. When information was released that we had found these elements in the car, the first thing that happened was a voice from London saying that if something had been found, it could only be due to the fact that we planted it there. Fantastic, isn't it? Paul Tavares protests with indignation while he walks across the room from one side to another and back. You know what, Chief? I'm fed up with those half profiles and people telling us that we need the CSI here. Those people have no idea how an investigation unfolds in reality. Francisco is upset about the notion that the criminal investigation works like in the American TV shows. This is completely wrong. It's one thing to analyze great amounts of blood or other bodily fluids and quite another to examine minuscule samples that may even be contaminated, which was the case. A Palma 5A had been covered with digital prints of the dozens of people that had been through it after the child had disappeared. Even if some criminal had entered the apartment and taken the little girl, what residues would have been left behind? Unless the person had sneezed or grabbed the door handle without gloves, there would have been nothing. With luck, some footprints might have been preserved, but by the time that the police arrived on location, tens of people had walked through the apartment covering the footprints of a possible stranger with their own. Paul Tavares did not lack ideas. What he needed now was to place them into position in order to be able to produce a theory that could explain the events of that evening and to sustain it on facts that could be proved in a courtroom. This seemed like a gigantic task to him. The whole investigation had been tainted with wrong information. Normally, investigators are able to discern what is correct from what is false. But the dimension that this case had achieved made it impossible to determine what was valid or not. Hundreds of witnesses had been heard, thousands of diligences had been carried out. It is all included in the process, and no matter how often one goes over it, there is always a possibility that the missing link is there, somewhere, hidden among millions of words. Perhaps that was uh, even the idea of... Uh, driving the investigation and the police officers into not even uh, knowing what is uh, true and what is fiction anymore. Sorry, I had some more water. Okay, let me carry on. Listen, Francisco, while we continue on our work of eliminating possibilities, let's imagine this was an abduction perpetrated by a stranger, a freak who wanted to hurt the little girl who realized that in the apartment he could not be at ease with her and took the child somewhere else. Let's admit that there was none of the noise that would be expected under such circumstances. We could even admit that the pig had his ways with the child. Did he abandon her on the street? I don't think so. He's not a human being anymore. He's an animal and he sees his task through. He knows that the child can point at him as the person who hurt her. Never. It's not only about prison. It's also about life in prison and the condemnation by society. Okay, then what, Chief? Keep going, Francisco says, intrigued about Paul Tavares' line of reasoning. Then... Then he had to get rid of the body because he could tell us a lot about what had happened and about the perpetrator, sea or land. For the sea, it's necessary to have means and the possibility of having them, of being transported to them with a child without being detected. I don't think so. A guy like this, under the circumstances, wants short distances and to spend as little time as possible with the victim. 
at least after he got what he wanted. Francisco interrupts, and also, at least to me, all the sightings of the child were nothing but people who had been under the suggestion of the phenomenon. If you look very closely, all those people who swore that they had seen the child with a couple or with a man said that she was very sad, calling out for her mother, and even that, so many days later, she was still wearing the same pajamas that she wore on the night that she disappeared. It's all fake. In all those cases that we managed to identify the child and the people, it was clearly proved that they were all mistakes. Some of those alerts even came from people who were perfectly honest, while others, I don't know, but maybe they were thinking of the millions in that reward. When money is thrown into the case, it just gets worse. People get so obsessed about the euros, they want to see Madeline anywhere. Do you remember Francisco Smiles, that guy, who called us saying that he had seen the girl on the train to Sintra accompanied by a man who had a suspicious face? There are some nut cases out there. That is just it, Francisco. Juan Tavares is animated. You have just touched an interesting point and I need no dogs to convince me of this. The child, unfortunately, does not belong to the world of the living anymore. Even if someone was holding her, could we ever believe that she would be kept in that condition knowing that this is the most publicized child in the world? I don't think so. The excessive publicity that was given to her face and to the issue of her iris were her condemnation, even in the case that she left the apartment alive. When a child goes missing because she is lost in a shopping center or on the beach, I think it's correct to tell the world about what should be told and to publicize the child's distinctive feature. Now, if she ever left there alive, Publicity killed her. She's worthless to the person who took her. For adoption is the biggest mistake ever. To be included in a PDF network, she's worthless under these circumstances, even more so because they prefer to keep both themselves and the children anonymous because if the children remain unknown, then the risks are less. The rest is just empty talk, my friend. She died and God take care of her because she was an innocent who fell into a world of pure beasts. Francisco had to agree with his chief. The months that have passed have proved just that, that the destiny of Madeline was sealed in one of two possible ways, during a time lapse that did not surpass two days. The first one, when she disappeared from that apartment, the second one, when her face and her distinctive signs were prematurely publicized to the world. He cannot understand why there was such a rush to publish the image or such a hurry in calling the British media on the night of the disappearance. Why the assumption that this was an abduction case when it had not yet been determined whether this was a simple case of leaving the apartment by herself. If, for example, on that night the children had been given the medicine that Madeline's grandfather had said they usually were given and which induces sleep and relaxation as side effects, then there would be an explanation for the fact that the McCann's immediately stated that the child could not have left on her own. Francisco and Juan Tavares are embroiled in this conversation when they are warned that a Spanish journalist called Tosca del Año is awaiting at the reception claiming to have valuable information about the case. Saffron is saying Amara's theory about Maddie hidden in the coffin under the other cadaver in the church makes a lot of sense too. Yes, it does make, yeah, it does make sense. Because then we also have the, the priest as well who knows the McCann's and we also know that the McCann's got the key for the church. So... Gary is saying, how can people in the medical world work with these animals? I have seen elsewhere a lot of them hate the McCann's. Yes, I've seen that as well. And 
honestly, I wouldn't want either one of them to treat me or my family or my children or anyone I know for that matter. Just because I know, in my opinion, what they did. And even if, let's say, let's say that they didn't do anything to Maddie, still the very fact that they left, left, left the three children alone while they went dining and drinking 12 bottles of wine or whatever as a group is just no no yes yeah, Efron, i agree here with you there must be a record of who the lady in the casket was and uh, what date her cremation was there must be a record yes but i don't think that i've uh, come across that anywhere but uh, it's not like I was looking for that in particular. Oh God, I keep drinking water and I get thirstier and thirstier. Okay, let me carry on with the next chapter here. Chapter number, yes, 14. The Frenchman from Spain. A knock on the door is followed by the entrance of a man in his 30s who is holding a briefcase under his arm. Francisco invites him to take a seat. Paul Tavares says that they are aware that the Spanish man has been trying to contact for quite some time now, but that they have been very busy. In a mixture of Portuguese and Spanish, the man replies that he understands. He states that, the, that he investigates this type of cases and that he holds information that he thinks is in their interest. But Francisco interrupts, as far as I know, you have been talking to the media for a while now, speaking about someone called El Frances, isn't it? Please tell us about that then. Yes, it's true. Yes, this man is very dangerous and we have to be very careful. Don't worry about that, Paul Tavares interrupts. Danger is our business. And we don't do anything else but handle those dangerous guys, he says, smiling. Well, I have documents here with me that will prove I'm right. This man works for PDF networks and he abducts boys and girls on order. I believe that Madeline is alive and that she is worth over 2 million euros for the trafficking network. 2 million, Francisco is surprised. So, Juan Tavares says, can you explain to me how the most wanted child in the world, one that has her photo visible just about everywhere, can be worth all that money. Isn't that a counter sense? But move on. What evidence do you have of what you are saying? We investigate all the possibilities, but we have to have something solid to work on. Otherwise, every person that walks into here tells us a different story. And there we go, following another ghost and collecting one more stamp to place into our scrapbook of invisible suspects. I'm sure you know what I mean, my friend. What do you base your allegation on? The man senses the provocative tone, but this is how it has to be done. One cannot show too much in interest under such circumstances, risking that the person who came into the police offices to give information lives with more than she walked in with. Here, information can only flow into one direction and this certainly is not from the police to the informant. I have information that the, that the man spoke to some persons in a bar in Seville and that he mentioned Madeline. Now you go and investigate. Well, that's better than Paul Tavares says. That's it then? You heard that some people heard about a Frenchman and this was in Seville and the guy who, according to you, works in child abductions for PDF networks, hangs around in bars speaking about it very well. I will tell you one thing then. I have a reputable psychologist that swears that she saw the child in the company of a couple, a Dutch man and an English woman in Belgium. We found them and everything has been clarified. If we hadn't, Belgium would be upside down by now. I have a teacher who swears that she saw the child crying out for her mother at a petrol station in Morocco. The images from the location show absolutely nothing. In Malta, she has been seen lots of times, but when it's time to catch her, it seems that she has been moved on to the other side of the island. After a pause, he continues. 
An illustrious architect in Switzerland also spotted a child in Greece. I have a brilliant detective from your country saying that he has surrounded a village in the mountains in Morocco because he's certain that the child was taken there and is being held captive. Right after that, he says it was Murat and his friend who abducted the child. To complete the film, as you well, you, a few days ago, the most wanted child in the world was being carried on the back of a poor woman along a national road in Morocco. This one got herself a photo and everything. As you can see, my dear friend, there are plenty of certainties in this case. But the difference is that someone who has no responsibility in the case can go around and say what he pleases while we have to sit in here and work through everything that pops up. Do you understand? then do us a favor and when you manage to collect more and better information than that, bring it over and we will be only too happy to analyze it, okay? The chief speech comes out all at once unloading his thoughts. Actually, this case is intoxicated with speculative information which contaminates the road that leads to the truth. After this episode and after yet another phone call from this individual, Paul Tavares refuses to see him again. Because apart from the lack of quality of the information that he was offering, he was far too worried about being photographed at the PJ's door in Portimao and giving interviews where he said nothing relevant and where he complained about having leads that the police did not value. The silence that, follow, that followed would end up proving that he had no credibility. Later on, Juan Tavares found out that the Spaniard had proposed to sell to Methodo 3 for 40,000 euros information that allegedly would lead them to the whereabouts of Madeleine McCann. Okay, let's go to the next chapter. Oh, where was I? Is the next chapter chapter 15? I forgot it already. Yeah, chapter 15. The secrets of Praia da Luz. A secret is something that is hidden from someone specific or from the world. It can be an action. Did I put it on your screen, guys? Ah, no. Okay, sorry. There it is. So, a secret is something that is hidden from someone specific or from the world. It can be an action, a piece of knowledge, a feeling. It's not what is being hidden that defines a secret, but rather the action of keeping it imposing a commitment on those who agree to keep it, be it between two persons or a group of people. The police in a, is an abstract entity that is formed by men and women that represent the idea of the institution. They all have their own secrets to keep and they do keep them, not only professional secrets, but especially personal ones. It was with men and women that a group of friends of the McCann family was confronted from that night onwards. They crossed paths with people who handled the, I didn't do it, I wasn't there at that time, I don't know that person, every single day of their professional lives. Later on, most of the times, the story ends with, it was him, I was there, and I know him. These men and women deal with repetitive mental schemes. People lie and policemen and women are used to hearing lies without indignation or constraint. They know it's part of the game. The PJ was surrounded in this case like he had never been in its history of over 60 years. He had never been so confined in its movements as there was no space left to even think about anything that diverted from the way. There were no solid constraints. There was no written order to do this and not that. But there was an avalanche of information like Portugal or the world had never seen. And simultaneously, the Madeline product was massified, placing the cherry on the top of the cake of this invisible corset. The fact is that the police, while exploring the wrong path for months, 
allowed for the secret to gain strength, to grow and to become almost indestructible. If the confrontation of versions and inconsistencies had taken place only days after the fact, we would probably be looking at a very different outcome today. And now, Prada Luz keeps a terrible secret. The most experienced policemen, those of older age and more experienced in life, commented softly among them that Madeline had not been abducted, not in the way that had been suggested to them. Their experience as policemen told them that child abductions are not murky cases like this one with discrepancies that simply have no solution. Mistakes are understandable under stress. The type of feelings that are experienced under such conditions often originate mismatching reports, but they remain understandable. That was not what happened with the McCanns, with their friends, with the waiters at the restaurant, or with other witnesses. Absolutely nothing was matching. This fact, if understood as an indication of guilt, can be understood as being the result of an accidental event. Nobody planned it. It simply happened and they adapted to it. But the secret behind this is still there. At this point, the policemen cannot hide their secret anymore. They have formally indicted the McCanns of having at least participated in the concealment of their daughter's body, and they have inferred from it that there has been a link between that concealment and the facts that originated the death that they suspect. As they could not discern any reason for anyone that was close to the child to end her life intentionally, they opted for the possibility of a domestic accident or a small aggression that might have ended tragically. This was the sequence that originated the formalization of the status of suspects in the practice of a crime on the parents of the child. The same policeman had defended since the beginning that the statements that the parents had made concerning not only the missing child, but also her siblings, proved that their behavior had been an infringement of the Portuguese penal code and effectively constituted a crime of exposure and abandonment. The secret that the policemen kept was that they suspected that the McCanns were telling them a lot less than what they knew. The entire development of the process ultimately confirmed that, ultimately confirmed that suspicion. They always kept talking to the couple regularly and in an amicable manner, but the dangers of such communication is that it's impossible to keep information flowing only in one direction. Some of the policemen in an initial phase understood the McCann's concern with the media as a manifestation of the famous British flag. They even conceived that those staged exits from the house with an advisor who informed the journalists of the exact route and of the gestures that would take place were done to keep their egos high. After all, these parents were at the center of the world attention. What seemed more worrying was that they saw this fact as an absolutely natural thing, as if every time that the child goes missing somewhere in the world, the media from all other countries rushed to the door of the house where the child had been taken from. It had never happened in such a, dim a dimension and it looked as if for the McCanns, it was just normal. And I'm going to stop at chapter 15. And let me go through some of your comments, guys. So Gary is saying they are intelligent people who aren't drunk, but they can't remember a simple occasion if they've done something on the way to their apartment or the way back. This German guy, even though he's an animal, is being used as a scapegoat. Christian Brugner, yes, I agree with you. And I think that uh, most of us agree with you.
Saffron is saying Bruckner will take a plea deal for a room with a view and few extra chocolate bars. They could put the case to rest if Bruckner takes the fall for it. Yes, they could uh, put the case to rest if he takes the fall for it. But then it kind of works a bit against the McCann's because if we are looking at the pattern over time, you know, each time that the reward needs to be renewed, as in, sorry, the funding needs to be renewed, they need to ask for new funding. It seems like something else is happening in the media and then they have a reason to have the funding given to them. And uh, if the case would be put to rest, then this wouldn't be happening anymore. So I'm not sure that they are looking for this. Maybe that's why they are keeping so quiet about Christian Brugner. I don't know, because they, they have not commented on Christian Brugner. But my guess is that if uh, this case would be put to rest, then there would be no reason for the money to keep coming. I don't know. Saffron is also saying, but for some strange reason, I think someone or something will come to light. I don't know what or when, but I strongly, I strongly feel it. And I know many others think the same. I'm hoping you are right. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Gary is also saying, I think they need to offer him more than that. Lots of money and name change at the least. All this needs to stop. The McCann's are guilty. The McCann's are making a lot of money from this. Yeah, that's why I'm saying that if uh, this case is put to rest and Christian Bruckner is convicted, then the funding would probably stop. I don't know. I really don't know. It's just, it hurts my brain. Doesn't it hurt your brain? Okay, guys, so we stopped at chapter number 15 and I'll have to write it down on my sticky notes because I always forget. So if I have the sticky notes in front of me, at least I remember where we finished chapter. So the next one will be chapter, what? 16, chapter 16. God, my memory starts getting so bad. Chapter 16, next. You know, I have sticky notes all over my place. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining. I will end this live and uh, I'll let you enjoy the rest of your weekend and the rest of your evening. You take care, guys, and be safe out there. And I'll be seeing you in the next live where I'm going to be reading the remaining chapters. Bye, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. Bye.